to my talk on Lord Ivor and the art market, or how did Kenwood House end up with such a fabulous art collection? My name is Bill Aldridge and I'm a volunteer at Kenwood House, a fine English heritage managed property in North London. Kenwood House was remodeled in the 1760s by the famous neoclassical architect Robert Adam. It sits at the top of Hampstead Heath and was the country home of Lord Mansfield, the Lord Chief Justice. Other talks in this series were put, put together by the friends of Kenwood House. We'll tell you more about that part of the Kenwood story. My talk is about Lord Ivor, Edward Cecil Guinness, who bought Kenwood House in the 1920s and gave it to the nation after his death in 1927. His story begins some 40 years earlier than this. When Edward Cecil Guinness walked down Bond Street with his wife Adelaide one fine day in June 1887, he started something that not only rescued many fine artworks for the nation, but also created the marvelous Ivor Bequest, which is the more correct name for Kenwood House. He dramatically changed the focus of the London art market, laying the foundation for it to become preeminent in the world. In the middle of the 19th century, the four main uh, auction houses, as Christie's, Sotheby's, Phillips and Bonhams, uh, were all involved in selling all the fine things that you needed to decorate your country home if you were a rich and wealthy uh, owner. They might include books, uh, paintings, furniture, silverware, uh, anything you needed, carpets, etc. And also, of course, paintings. And then in 17... Uh, 87, John Christie, who'd founded the Christie's Auction House, had the idea that maybe paintings were something special and they ought to have an auction just of paintings. Now, so he set this up and expected great uh, sales to happen. In fact, rather sadly, nothing was sold from that sale at all. None of the lots were bought. And so, being a cautious lot, of course, all the auction houses took note of this and said, well, let's carry on doing what we're doing. You know, the books, the furniture, the carpets, et cetera, et cetera. And paintings continue to be just some of the fine wallpaper that they could put up. Most of the great collections of art in the country were owned by aristocrats. They've been collected through the years of uh, tour, grand tours of various parts of Europe, particularly Italy, of course. Uh, and sometimes they would go and hire the late, the greatest artists of the day to paint themselves or their children or their wives or maybe their girlfriends and also their country estates and the fine landscapes around them. Um, they might even go and buy contemporary art from the Royal Academy, that newfangled institution set up uh, in Burlington House. Uh, but in fact, of course, that was always risky because the, the fashions might change. Now, if you weren't going to inherit one of these fine collections and you wanted to, you were a rich man and you wanted to buy an, a, a nice collection of paintings, there are various hurdles to cross. First of all, there's the question of expertise and discernment. Forgers have been very clever through the years in reproducing uh, the, uh, the style of famous artists. And they're even sneaky enough to take some of the best student work from that artist's uh, atelier, atelier and add the famous artist's name at the bottom so they could add more value to the painting. You could go and buy contemporary work, of course, from this newfangled institution, the Royal Academy. Uh, but again, fashions change and you could end up with a real dud on your walls. Most importantly, there was something called the laws of entailment. Now, the laws of entailment were designed to protect the aristocratic estates. And they stated that you could not uh, sell any part of your estate. It all had to be handed down intact to your heirs. Now that included the paintings on the walls. <clears throat> this worked fine until uh, 1840, 1846, 
when the Corn Laws were repealed. The Corn Laws have been introduced in 1815 to uh, limit the import of cheap grain from North America. And of course that helped to keep the aristocratic estates income up because they're mostly agricultural. Uh, but in 1846, there were riots, there, were, there was a lot of uh, criticism of this, the poor were struggling to pay for bread, and so the corn laws were repealed. The price of corn went down, and, so, and of course also did the income of the, of, the, of the aristocratic estates. This meant that the aristocrats were struggling, and the government recognized this. And so in 1882 to 1890, they introduced a number of changes to the laws of entailment. And in summary, this meant that they could now sell some of their paintings on the walls as long as the money went back into the estates. And it was around this time that Edward Cecil Guinness took his famous walk down Bond Street with his wife, um, uh, and uh, looking for paintings. And the aristocratic families were all set up to start selling theirs. Let me introduce you to the main protagonist of the story. Here he is, Lord Ivor, Viscount Elverdon, Knight of the Order of St. Patrick, Knight of Grand Cross, etc., etc. This painting on the left is by Cope. It's a very fine painting and shows Lord Ivor at the peak of his social status. He's uh, received all these honours that he's garnered, that you can see on the screen, through uh, great acts of philanthropy, founding the Guinness Art Housing Trust, co-founding the Lister Hospital, underwriting expeditions to Antarctica. There was even a Mount Iver there. The image on the right shows a, a, glass, a stained glass window dedicated to him in St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, where the main university park was his own back garden and his former country house is now used as the residence for visiting heads of state. So uh, of course, as you all know, or have probably guessed from the name, Edward Cecil Guinness was a member of the Guinness family that founded the Guinness Drinks Company. In fact, he was a great grandson of the founder, Arthur Guinness. He and his brother inherited the company and, and became co-owners of the company. And then in 1876, a couple of years after that, in a bold and true business move, Edward Cecil Guinness bought out his brother's share for 600,000 pounds, quite a considerable sum. So he found himself at the age of 29, the sole owner and chief executive of a large drinks company. And the first thing he did was make it very much larger. Here's a, a, an image of the factory that uh, Edward Cecil Guinness had designed and rebuilt. So here at the back you can see the uh, factories churning out the drinks and uh, you can see that he's set up a railway line that runs round and comes down to the dockside and he's even built special barges to carry the drinks down the River Liffey to the port of Dublin to be taken worldwide. He looked after his workers too. He built all these houses at the back for his workers. Residents of Dublin named this a city within a city. It was an incredibly bold move, but Edward Cecil matched this investment with excellent marketing that saw the output double in three years and then double again in another three years. By 1886, the year of uh, this famous Bond Street, it, it, Bond Street expedition, he, uh, Edward Cecil Guinness decided to launch his drinks company on the stock market. He put it up for, put up for sale 6% of his holding. It was a massive success. The shares were 10 times oversubscribed. And so of course, the price zoomed up. Overnight, Edward Cecil Guinness became vastly rich. In fact, his wealth was measured as about 6% of the GDP of the UK, which in today's terms makes it 25 billion pounds. He stepped down as chief executive officer of the company and he and his wife Adelaide headed to London. They'd always been Anglophile Irish uh, people. And so London at the time was the center of the world 
and they wanted to become part of that society. He and Adelaide loved giving parties, loved being sociable. And so with all that money in his pocket, aged only 39, he was ready to make it in, the London, in London society. First, they needed a fine home and they found one at the top of Grosvenor Gardens. Those of you who know the geography of London will know that that's exactly where uh, Hyde Park Corner is. Across the road, you've got Apsley House called Number One London, Wellington's home. And then just looking out of the other windows, you'd see right across into the back garden of the Queen. You couldn't have a finer address. That house had 150 rooms. It needed a lot of furnishing. And as one, and a, as one wit once said, what a rich man needs to become a gentleman is an art collection. So here they are. This is Adelaide on the left, affectionately known as Dodo, and Edward Cecil Guinness looking very dapper on the right in this cartoon from Spy magazine, which was the, um, the private eye of the day. He looks very smart, but maybe not as distinguished as he is in the coat painting. In fact, a contemporary account describes them thus. A stocky gentleman with a marked Irish brogue, accompanied by his wife, a modest, unassuming little woman in a plumed hat. They look like a country couple dressed up for a visit to the city. Oh, ouch, not very flattering. And perhaps not surprising, if not forgivable, that the first art dealer they went into, the young assistant said, oh, I'm terribly sorry, sir, but the directors are all at lunch. Please come back later. This was Edward Cecil Guinness, probably at this point, the richest man in England. And he'd run a major company. He was, wasn't going to put up with that. He and Adelaide marched out of there and went down the road to Thomas Agnew and son. There on the left is Thomas Agnew's very fine gallery that they'd only built eight years earlier in Bond Street. Now Agnew's stayed in this gallery for about a hundred years and then they were bought out by another company and moved from this, this building. But the building is still there. Now Agnew's, as you can probably guess from the right, a picture on the right, which is the label they put on all the pictures that they sold, was a company from the north of England, from Manchester to be exact. And they were very proud of the fact. And because they come from the north of England, they knew how to talk to the rich industrialists. The Agnew's assistant was more astute. Their directors were also at lunch, but this assistant made his new guests comfortable and brings out the finest paintings that Agnew's has in their storeroom. Delighted, Edward Cecil Guinness buys three paintings that day. And from then on, he only buys through Agnews. In total, over five years, he buys 217 of the finest paintings. 63 of these have ended up in the collection in Kenwood House. Of the remainder, half are in the National Gallery of Ireland in Dublin, and half have been retained by the family in Norfolk. One painting that Edward Cecil Guinness bought is this very fine Rembrandt, Judas Repentant. It was not bought through Agnews, but I wanted to show it to you because I wanted to dispel any thoughts you might have that Edward Cecil Guinness was just a rich playboy who splashed out vast amounts of cash just to buy the, a world-class art collection. No, Edward Cecil Guinness was a discerning collector long before he started this famous five-year buying spree. He had been a collector from a young age. This painting was bought when he was only 26, and he only paid 500 pounds for it. He definitely had an eye for a bargain. The Kenwood Rembrandt, the famous self-portrait, late self-portrait, marks the end of Rembrandt's turbulent career, but this painting marks the beginning. It has all the hallmarks of Rembrandt's dramatic handling of light and shade to create a strong narrative. In this case, it's the story of Judas returning 30 pieces of silver to the Pharisees. The strong diagonal from the lower left to the upper right uh, leads our eye up to the chief Pharisee whose expression tells us that something momentous is happening. 
The figure just below him has put his hand out in a gesture of rejection that takes our eye down to the pathetic figure of Judas. Ignored by the others in the painting, he looks down at the scattered coins on the ground that lead him and our eye to the dark space on the left of the painting. This black space next to the brightly lit book is the fate of Judas' soul. Constantin Hugens, an art patron and secretary to the Prince of Orange, had heard of two young, still beardless painters in Leiden, Rembrandt and Jan Lievens. He paid them a visit. He gave particular praise to Judas Repentant and became a, an enthusiastic collector of both artists. Other court officials heard of this and also placed commissions. Shortly after this visit, Rembrandt moved to Amsterdam where his career took off. Edward Cecil Guinness, who chose this painting and the Rembrandt self-portrait, clearly had a connoisseur's eye. Here's that late self-portrait on the left. And here's a couple of other really fantastic paintings in the Kenwood collection. The Vermeer in the middle of the lady with the guitar and the Franz house on the right. Edward Cecil Guinness was also a keen yachtsman and he liked paintings with a nautical theme, such as the Turner Sea piece on the left, which sits opposite the Decoip on the, which is the painting on the right. And he and Adelaide were also keen collectors of prints called the beauties of the 18th century. So when they came into this vast sum of money, they now delighted themselves in collecting the real thing. This is Gainsborough's Lady Howe on the left, fantastic painting, a very one, one of the best by Gainsborough. And in the middle is Reynolds' Mrs. Musters. And on the right, a very fine painting by George Romney. Edward Cecil Guinness pushed Agnews very hard for, to get this collect together in only five years. And Agnews responded by approaching landowners with significant sums of money to tempt the best paintings off the walls. Agnews even approached some of their own clients like Rothschild with a tempting offer to buy back paintings that they previously sold to them. The company continued to flourish for the next hundred years, dealing with many prestigious clients, including the US industrialists, art collectors, Mellon and Frick. But in all this time, in all that hundred years, Edward Cecil Guinness remained their biggest and best client. The auction houses, Recognizing the special opportunities offered by art sales quickly changed tack and focused more of their efforts on selling and dealing in art. And so the London art market grew and became what it is today. Edward Cecil Guinness, Earl of Ivor, died in 1927. The title passed to his son, Rupert. And Rupert was interviewed on the radio in 1950. And I'd like to quote from that interview. My father, during the First World War, spent a good deal of time up here at Heath House in Hampstead. He was very much impressed and delighted with Hampstead and the country around. And at the time, Kenwood came up for sale. And it was his idea, a most wonderful idea, I think, to give some of his best paintings to be seen in their proper surroundings. Kenwood and its marvelous collection was open to the public on the 18th of July, 1928. And thanks to Lord Ivor, the Ivor bequest remained open and free ever since. It is now managed by English Heritage. Thank you.